Welcome back uh, to another session of the Meetings with Saints Virtual Summit and also this podcast episode. Today, I'm sitting down through the powers of the internet with Stephen Rogelberg. How are you, Stephen? I'm great. Good to be here. Nice. Now, you are the author of a book I just read and really enjoyed called The, the Surprising Science of Meetings, How You Can Lead Your Team to Peak Performance. So are you like the meeting guy or, or where does this come from? It appears so. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been doing research on this crazy topic of meetings for over 20 years. And um, it was just something I was passionate about as a professor. And so I've been producing all this research, um, publishing in a, vo- in a host of academic journals. And I reached a point where I wanted to start communicating the messages to leaders. And that's what motivated me to write this book. Um, yeah. And it's been super exciting to see this incredible reaction to it. Yeah. No, and and I really enjoyed reading it. And uh, a lot of it's some of the, some of those topics or um, points that you discuss. Like, if you don't tell them to people, it's it's common sense. And yeah, we all know that. But the, the application is sometimes so difficult, even though we know these things, right? Uh, that's the case with so many things, right? Where yeah. we know one thing, but do a different thing. And, but I, I think that's what was, what was kind of fun about the book is that, you know, there's good research stories. And I think these stories just help you internalize um, the messages a little bit more deeply. And I also think, and I know we'll talk more about this, is, you know, my approach is so fundamentally different because the research doesn't s- suggest a formula for meeting success. It doesn't say do A, then B, then C. Instead, what it talks about is the importance of being intentional and making good choices. And there's not one best choice, but the key is just making choices. Just don't dial it in. Think about the meeting experience. So I think it's a much more empowering message um, because what I do is I lay out a variety of options for people. And then they get to pick and choose what makes sense to them, given their own values, as well as the values of the people in the meeting. Yeah, yeah. And there's so many uh, areas and topics that we'll dive into. But let me, let me kind of set the stage for you specifically. Please. So this audience, um, you know, our organization is Leading Saints. And uh, I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormon Church, but it's all done on a lay ministry, right? So mm-hmm. it could be an auto mechanic that's uh, the, the, the bishop of the ward. I've been a bishop with a marketing background, or it could be a, a PhD level organizational, you know, uh, theorist, right? And so um, what happens is sometimes people just work with what their background has. Sure. So maybe they, they're in a industry, they work their day job that isn't necessarily in, uh, in an organization with a lot of meetings. And so they sort of just run the meeting, how they seen the last guy do it or whatever. So sometimes the, the, the ability there, the skill level isn't, isn't assumed, or we didn't go to some seminary to, to acquire all the, all these skills. So, so I got to ask you, since this is a, a Mormon audience, do you have any standout good or bad interactions with a Mormon? <laughs> well, I have a branch of my family that's Mormon. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> so no, I'm, I'm, we're good. <laughs> so, you, so you interact with them and you know, they're, they're fairly normal. We're, we're fairly normal. They people, are. Right? <laughs> yes, they are. Um, in fact, my um, the doctoral student who has really been my partner with most of uh, my research on meetings um, is also Mormon. Oh, nice. Uh, so, um, yeah. Is he the yeah. one that's at the University of Utah right now? Exactly. You know, I, I read his name in the, in the book. I thought, oh, maybe that's another potential interview. So I Googled him real fast. I'm like, wait a minute. He's just down the street from me. So I, awesome. I hope to reach out to him, connect with him. But uh, Beautiful. Well, cool. So that's sort of the, the how we're approaching this is that uh, it, we're, we're sort of all over the map with our perspective of meetings. And if there's yeah. anything in leadership in, in our church where people kind of really roll their eyes, it comes with meetings. And I guess that goes for, for any organization. And so um, I guess maybe a good place to start is just the, the cost of meetings. And you, and you mm-hmm. talk about this in a few chapters that we, we get so hypersensitive with financial costs, right? Or spreadsheets, but we just completely ignore the cost that meetings can be. So how would you explain the cost of meetings? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, meetings are incredibly expensive. Um, you know, when we think about time by people's salaries, you can identify direct costs associated with the engagement but those are actually um, underestimates. Um, 
So first of all, from a direct cost perspective, you know, it's not unusual to have uh, a meeting at work costing $500 and a meeting at work costing $5,000, um, depending on the level of the individuals in there and how long the meeting is. But then you have indirect costs. Uh, first of all, there's opportunity costs. People could be doing something else, um, you know, helping a customer that they're not able to do. Then you have frustration costs. We have research showing that bad meetings also hurt your engagement overall with the job, which is certainly another cost. And then there's even something called meeting recovery syndrome. Oh, wow. And this is the idea that when we have a bad meeting, we just don't leave it at the door. It sticks with us. Yeah. And we ruminate and we need to talk to others about the bad meeting. Especially if we take it home to our spouse, right? And we just, do. Uh, we won't do. believe this. <laughs> you won't believe this. So, yeah. So, it is an incredibly expensive um, uh, phenomenon, especially when you think of the fact that there are 55 million meetings a day in the US alone. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, so, that's just something to be aware of that just because everybody's in a room and it feels like we're getting stuff done doesn't mean that uh, we're, 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 we're not spending a lot of, of, of uh, resources, right? That's exactly right. And, you know, that, I, I love how you just said that because if a leader just internalizes that notion, right, if they just internalize that there's a cost associated with this interaction, I think it starts to trigger that intentionality and thoughtfulness that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And, and like you said, you know, in an organization, there's a financial cost, but, you know, in a volunteer organization, it's easy. A leader could say, oh, but we're all volunteers. You know, I'm, there's no, I'm not paying an hourly rate for everybody here, but there's especially, obviously you mentioned the opportunity cost is one thing, but really there's this huge expense of morale, right? When, when a meeting doesn't go well, there's a, an expense of morale in the organization. Oh, yeah. I mean, we want to be good stewards of everyone's time, whether that person is being paid or whether they're a volunteer. Um, you know, if we want people to be engaged volunteers and we want people to tell other people that they should be volunteering, we want these meetings to be meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So this other concept, there, there's a few concepts in, in, in your book that sort of came out of nowhere for me. I didn't even, uh, didn't even consider as it relates to meetings. And one of them is self-awareness of a leader. Uh, where yeah. do we begin with this discussion or what could you teach us about the importance of being self-aware as a leader as it relates to meetings? Yeah, boy, um, that's such an important topic. Um, so let me share a, a research finding that I talk about in the book. Um, you know, if you survey a meeting, there is typically one person who will leave that meeting saying, hey, that was a good use of time. I liked it. And do you want to guess who that person is? Yeah, the person that's leading the meeting. Right? Yeah, yeah, the, the meeting leader, right? The, the boss, right? Because they're in control. But we know from people's frustrations that there's some type of misalignment. And this is really important to recognize. Um, because if leaders have an inflated perception of the meeting, then they're not all that motivated to make them better, yeah. right? If you think they're going well, you're like, okay, I, I'm fine. We have a good process. We have a good structure. So given that leaders seem to have this um, misaligned self-awareness, then one of the first things a good leader needs to do is to build self-awareness based on the voices of those in the meeting. And again, this is perfect for volunteer-based organizations because um, it's so aligned with the notion of stewardship, right? And, and when you think about your church and think about people volunteering, this notion of stewardship yeah. is so fundamental, yeah. right? Absolutely. And so if I want to be a good steward, how do I communicate that to people? Well, I ask them their opinions, and then I care about their opinions, and I want to do something about it. So if I'm a, a leader, and I want to do better at it, and I give people an anonymous survey to complete or a piece of paper where they can write down some remarks about what goes well in our meetings, what's not so good in our meetings, and what can we do better, and then I actually try to make changes, well, that, that moves the dial in a very dramatic way. 
and it addresses the self-awareness issue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. That, um, and, and this is the, the thing that stood out to me, just that how you started that as a leader, I've run a lot of meetings and that I felt really good about because I got all the time I needed to voice my perspective, my thoughts, my sure. insight. And so I could leave the meeting feeling really good about it where 80% of the other people felt like, man, I didn't get a chance to get a word in edgewise or anything. And it's so frustrating right. to be in that meeting. Right. And so just to step back and say, do I feel good about my meetings because I'm talking a lot or do other people uh, actually feel that way? Exactly. Really it, right. Well said. And I mean, that's one of the things I talk about in some of the speeches I give is, you know, I certainly want people to formally assess um, their meetings. I'm a big fan of that, doing that survey. But in the absence of that survey, you can also do some reflection. Um, if you're the one doing most all the talking, that's most likely an indication that you're not doing a good job. If everyone is on their phones multitasking, <laughs> that's probably another sign that you're not doing a good job. If there's a host of side conversations or there's a bunch of people who are not participating, again, that's a sign that you're not doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so those are some quick things to note just in any meeting to see sure. is that happening? It's probably something yeah. wrong. So you talk about a survey. What are some other ways as far as to increase our self-awareness? I mean, do, do you just hand out a survey? Do you meet with people one-on-one? Sure. -on -one? Or, or what are some other tactics that you would recommend? I, I, um, I think first step is just that quick little survey monkey, Qualtrics, three questions, what's going well, not so well, and what can we do better? What can I do better as a, as a meeting leader? Um, and I think that's a beautiful way of starting. And then look for themes. Um, I like taking the perspective of, um, you know, find that, do that thematic analysis, see the one or two things that seem to be emerging and just work on those. Like, don't try to do too much, just do the little things. Um, and then in another three months, do another assessment. If it's the case that you're, when you're looking at the survey data, that maybe there's some things that are ambiguous, then I think some of these one-on-one -on -one conversations can be very helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like the idea of keeping it simple. Um, yeah. Very simple tool um, where you frame it to people, you frame it such that um, you, you tell people, listen, I really value your time. I do not want to waste your time. And it's within that spirit that I want to ask you these three questions. Yeah. No, I love Who doesn't that. want to fill out that survey, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, you can get to almost hyper focused on, I really want to make this a good meeting. And, and really nobody's ever done a perfect meeting as, as far as I'm concerned, but um, just the, just the act of being intentional of, of doing a survey or, or, or seeking their feedback, you're, that puts you light years ahead of probably most managers or leaders they've ever had in their experience. Right. You are so correct. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, and again, I think that's why this book is really working for people is that it does keep it simple like this. Um, it's making your meetings better um, can start with just some small, simple choices and then reflecting and then thinking about a few different choices to make. Um, but the beautiful thing about meetings is that they're just so bad that when we make small changes, they have tremendously positive impact. Yeah. Any other thoughts sort of uh, dovetailing off that subject with as far as as far as how much um, as the leader, just uh, the, the power of just being as quiet as possible in meetings. I mean, any, any other thoughts with that is, I mean, should a leader just really try and I've heard some people say, just ask questions in meetings, you know, try not to pontificate too much, but any other thoughts as far as what the leader could do to just, just shut up in the meeting? Sure. Um, so that it's a great question. And so I, okay. So th there's, a few different ways I want to respond to this. So first of all, if the leader already knows what the answer has to be, then I'd rather them be transparent with that, hmm. right? So if there is a truth out there that people have to know um, that, you know, a decision's already been made, let's not pretend it's not. Um, 
what I, I want leaders to be is honest. Um, and so if they want discussion, they have to recognize that when they go first, um, that that will shape the entire discussion. And so if we want a genuine interaction, then we want to frame the challenge. We want to share with people the the parameters around that challenge in an honest way. And then we want to create a dialogue and a conversation around it and where the leader goes on this journey. Um, but the best meeting leaders aren't necessarily silent, right? Because the best meeting leaders are also doing all kinds of facilitating types of um, orations, right? They're saying, hey, I haven't heard from you, Gordon. Uh, Sasha, unpack this for me more. Um, you know, Jane, are you, do you agree with what's being talked about here? So they're talking, they're facilitating, they're in charge, they're making it happen. And when they do have something to say that's critical, they say it, right? Mm -hmm. So I want people to, like, you're the leader for a reason, right? You might have advanced in this organization because you do have good ideas and good insights. Um, so if there's something that you feel is, you know, you're really passionate around, you know, share it. But what I tell when I coach leaders is I just want you to pick your battles, right? So if it's not all that important, just let the group make the decision. If it's something really is critical, then let people know where you stand. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Just that the first point you made is as far as just being honest and, and we even have even a, even a more dy uh, magnified dynamic of this in our culture, because not only is, is, you know, a Bishop of, of this meeting, the leader, but he, we also assume he has some sort of revelatory capacity from God to dictate mm. revelation for that organization. So if he speaks too much, people can sort of say like, well, I guess yeah. that's what we're supposed to do if 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 you say it right. So it can be even more dangerous uh, with that uh, caveat there too. But and I, and and I appreciate that you. What I'm, what I'm learning from this is that a leader may come into that meeting and he may sort of have a decision made up already. But him or her just being honest of saying, you know, I sort of. I have an idea of where I want to go with this, but I still want to have a discussion and maybe you can guide me away from that. In fact, I want you to, if you think I should, go yes. out, let's have a discussion rather than not saying anything and sort of manipulating the discussion. Exactly. Even, even unintentionally. Right. Oh, that's uh, yeah. I, I love how you said that. And it's just about transparency. Yeah. Right. When we think about the best leaders and the best stewards, um, right. There's a level of transparency and honesty. And then by being transparent and honest, it allows you at times to lead from the front, but also a lot of the times to lead from the back. Mm -hmm. And in all cases, you're doing it in a genuine way. And, and just to add on that. Leading from the front, as long as you've also led from the back before. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and just, you know, even if you, I think it just sort of stating where you are at beginning that meeting as the leader of the meeting is, is so helpful, like you said, transparency. Even if you say, you know, I'm going to leave it up to you as this council to make this decision, even if maybe I'm not on board, let's see where this discussion yep. takes us, right? And and that makes for a better meeting. It, it really does. And people feel um, very respected. Yeah. For sure. And, and that respect goes a long way in, in some of these situations. Um, anything else as, as far as um, the leader talking too much or not talking much or being transparent, honest, facilitating, anything that we that would be worth mentioning? Um, no, I mean, I think we okay. hit a lot of the key topics. Um, I'm sure we'll talk, you know, when we think about being an effective leader, we think about um, three phases. Um, we talk about, you know, kind of planning the meeting. Um, designing the meeting that's kind of that first phase and then we talk about um how you facilitate the meeting and then kind of that post-meeting activity um and i think we've just done a really good job capturing that middle piece gotcha and well then that kind of gives me a place to to go from here um that relates to other topics i want to touch on but as far as planning the meeting i think in our culture uh in a, in a volunteer organization it's sort of like plan a meeting. Like I'm, I'm lucky if I'm on time for that meeting, let alone plan sure. the meeting. Um, what, what thoughts would you have as far as planning a meeting effectively, sure. even when time is constrained? Yeah. Um, 
So planning a meeting is not a very time consuming activity. Um, and I, I'm gonna share an example. Uh, so I've, I've used this language a bunch so far in our conversation about this notion of being a good steward of others' time. And there are lots of times uh, places where we really do embrace that stewardship. A good example is, let's say we're meeting with an important customer or we're meeting with a boss's boss. Um, we, we don't want that person leaving the meeting saying that was a waste, right? You just yeah. literally re killed my time. Yeah. And we know that. And because of that, we spend a little time thinking about the meeting experience before it starts. And if we really do meaningful self-reflection, we recognize that that's actually really fast. It could be 30 seconds. It could be two or three minutes. It doesn't take that long just to stop and say, okay, I'm having a meeting. Who really needs to be there? Um, what might be a good approach for making it a good meeting? Um, you know, how can I, you know, should I leverage silence in there? Um, you know, what type of an agenda approach should I do? Um, should I let people use apps to vote on a screen? Um, you know, so just kind of thinking through things could really just be a handful of minutes. Uh, so I would say that no one's too busy to invest that handful of minutes, especially because the return of investment is so high. And remember um, that five minutes is designed to save people, you know, when you think about an hour meeting and 10 people on that one hour meeting, that's 10 hours, Yeah. right, of collective time. So you're investing five minutes to make 10 hours better. Yeah, and that, that goes a long way, right? Just to take that, those few minutes to yeah. take a deep breath and say, what's our intention here? What are we trying to accomplish? And that's let's right. go in there and make Well, it and even building off what you just said, take a deep breath. It's funny, there's this technique uh, called the pre-mortem. And this is just the idea that before you, um, when you know you're about to have a meeting, think for a moment of that meeting going wrong. <laughs> it's a becoming bad. Uh -huh. And then what can you do to prevent that real that possible reality from happening? And it's an interesting exercise because once you kind of think of it that way, now you say, okay, well, if I do this, this is this, the chances of that happening are much lower. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That even because typically in a meeting, there may be two or three people that are in charge of that meeting. So just getting with them quickly and saying, all right, what could go really bad here? And what, what can we do to avoid that? Right. Love it. Easy. Yeah. yeah. So this uh, leads in another question that you talk about a lot as far as uh, uh, agendas go, because if there's anybody, you know, in, in our church, like if you're ask a seasoned leader, like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm new in leadership. What should I do? to run an effective meeting nine times out of 10, they'll look at me and say, what you need to do is have an agenda. It's like, that's like the magic pill. Like I just need right. an agenda and everything that's, will go great. But right. what, what do we need to consider as far as planning in relation to an agenda or, or the purpose of an, an agenda? Great question. Um, so I have a chapter in the book, as you know, and the it deserves a whole called, chapter. So I, and I don't expect does. you to, to do it all here. But. Um, so the chapter is called, Agendas are a hollow crutch. Hmm. And the, interestingly, the research shows that having an agenda in, of a, in and of itself does almost nothing to improve wow. a meeting. And if you stop for a moment and reflect, this shouldn't surprise you, right? Yeah. What matters most is not having an agenda, but what's on the agenda, right? Is it right. relevant to people? How did you build that agenda? Did you solicit input from others? And most importantly, how did you facilitate that agenda, right? So if the agenda has an item that's even relevant to people, but you dominate and don't let any other voices to emerge, clearly people are not gonna think of it as a good experience. So agendas are, um, can be very problematic for people because just as you said, they think they have one and now they say, ah, oh, I'm good. And what I want people to do is to be much more thoughtful around agendas. So think about, and I'll, I'll, let, me, let me give you an example. Um, most agendas are framed as a set of topics to be covered. And what I wanna challenge a meeting leader to do is to pot potentially, at times, frame your agenda as a set of questions to be answered. 
This is a very different activity, very different exercise. By thinking about your meeting as a set of questions to be answered, mm -hmm. you think more carefully, right? Yeah. You Now you're dialed in on what the outcomes of the meeting will be. By framing it as questions, you have a better sense of who really needs to be there because they're relevant to the questions. You know when to end the meeting because the questions have been answered. And if you just can't think of any questions, it likely means you don't need a meeting. Mm. So there's ways of leveraging agendas that I think good things can happen. I'm gonna share just another couple of examples. Um, a lot of meeting leaders think that every piece of the agenda they have to own. But that's not true. Like we can share agenda responsibilities. This is a great way of engaging more people in it, right? So different agenda items can be assigned to different people to lead, right? Now they feel empowered and important. So that's another small technique. Even how we order agenda items is important. Right? So many times agendas are ordered from news, 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 and then we save the most important issue to the end of the meeting. Well, the research shows that what's ever in the front of the meeting receives the most amount of attention. So when we call our volunteers together, after five minutes of kind of conversation and maybe some news, we should go hard on the most important, compelling topic. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard because those you know, the news or the, 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 the lighter stuff is sort of, we use as a runway to really get the juices flowing to that big one. So it's sometimes hard to just jump right into that, that big I know. meaty topic. Right. But yes. And I do like the idea of a little bit of a runway. Um, but it just should be a little bit, um, you know, think about when someone once shows up at a meeting and you start with the most powerful, important topic fast, they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm really glad I'm here. Yeah. Right. It's a very different reaction than what most people have at the beginning of meeting where they're typically like, oh, my goodness, what is going on here? This could have been an email. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you never want people to think this could have been an email. That, right. right. That's, that's the word. Um, and I, I want to underscore sort of this as far as this concept of an agenda should or a good approach to an agenda is a list of questions. And I would imagine even if you've had very minimal time to prepare, even if you don't have a printed out agenda to start the meeting in the spirit of that transparency that you talked about saying, OK, before we jump into our discussion, what are the questions that as a group we want to answer today and start writing them on the board, right? Like that's a, a good runway to really jumping into the meeting and making sure it's an effective meeting for everybody. Sure. I, I think that could absolutely work. Um, I also like the idea that when you announce the meeting, you provide people with the opportunity to email you in advance. Yeah. The key questions that have to be answered. Yeah. And you can see where uh, folks are at. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I think that there's, you know, depending on the time the individual has um, that we can start our meetings in a way that really get them off on the right foot. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, let's move into as far as uh, times and lengths of meetings, because this is sure. one that, and I've been in some of these myself in, in a volunteer organization and a volunteer church that uh, you know, there's so much, you know, these are part-time uh, callings that people have and their insurance sure. callings. They've worked, worked 50 hours a week at their office. Now they have to come, you know, conquer the world of their church. And and uh, sometimes they feel like, you know, we just got to get in a room and no matter how long it takes, we just got to get it done. And I've heard about, you know, meetings going till midnight, you know, three hours long and you're just going through it. So how would you help somebody who is perpetually having these two, three hour yeah. meetings and, and what do we need to understand about lengths of meeting times? Good, good, good question. Um, so there's a few things that the science talks about. Uh, so first of all, there's this notion of Parkinson's law. Mm, and I Parkinson's law is the idea that work expands to fill whatever time is allotted to it. So a meeting scheduled for two hours magically takes two hours, two hours. <laughs> right? Um, so this basically tells us that as a meeting leader, when we're designing a meeting, we want to think more carefully about meeting times. We want to say, well, if we're trying to achieve this, this, and this, how long should that take? And we might say, you know what? Maybe that'll take 50 minutes. 
And once we decide on a meeting time, what I want to encourage meeting leaders to do is actually dial it back five to 10 minutes. Because we also know from um, meetings research that when groups are under um, a moderate amount of pressure, they tend to be more focused and perform more optimally. Hmm. So this is really an important takeaway. So that if you want your groups to produce good stuff in these meetings, then having some additional time pressures is actually a really good thing. Hmm. Um, so if you are planning your meeting and you say, you know what, this meeting is going to be 55 minutes, 48 minutes, people are going to be like, what, what's going on here? And you know what, if your meeting is 48 minutes and it's good, people are going to be so happy and if they have extra time, they'll just hang out and socialize with each other. But that should take place outside the meeting. Yeah. Meetings are for business, right? Meetings are to get things done. Socializing can take place before the meeting. It can take place after the meeting, um, over coffee, whatever. But when you call a meeting, the purpose of the meeting is to get stuff done. Yeah. I love that. And, and with these time constraints, it can be difficult because you may, you know, feel like, okay, I'm, I'm motivated, motivated by what Steven's saying. My next meeting, I'm going to go in there and say, we're, we're not going any longer than 50 minutes. And then you get to 50 minutes. You think, okay. We got to wrap up. Oh, one more thing. Oh, okay. One more thing real quick. And then it's, you know, 15 minutes after the yeah. time and you think, oh, well we were close. Right. But right. I found in my experience that those first couple of meetings, you just have to be completely strict of like, no, we're not, we're done. We're talking about, we're, we're walking right. out of the room now. We're leaving. Right. And then over Absolutely. time people get accustomed to that. Right. That is perfect. Yes. Well said. Yeah. I mean, it's a training process. Um, it's, it's a discipline process, Yeah, but, um, it absolutely can be achieved. And, you know, the value of it is immense, right? I mean, volunteer time is precious. I mean, time in general is precious, but volunteer time is so precious. Um, you know, someone's giving you such a gift. And if you can take 50 minutes as opposed to two hours, I mean, that kind of respect pays dividends. Yeah. Right? They're going to be more willing to volunteer in the future. Um, and they're just going to feel good about the engagement and yeah. just keep going and just be fully present. Yeah. You know, there's, there's tons of research as far as, you know, of trust as, as the importance of trust, especially in those that we lead. And there's no better way almost to, to, to build trust with individuals by respecting their time. And when you say that this meeting is going to go to here and then we're done, like, okay, I'll come to your next meeting. If that's the case, exactly. if that's how you're going to run meetings, I can't wait for the next one. Right. That's right. <laughs> so. No, you're absolutely right. You know, people, um, People don't hate meetings. They hate bad meetings. Right. <laughs> this is an important distinction. Uh, I mean, a world without meetings is much more meetings for communication, cooperation, consensus decision making. Right. Meetings are essential. Um, so the goal is to eliminate bad meetings and bad meeting time. And the meeting science can help. Um, there are decisions we can make that can absolutely honor people's time and make time and meetings effective and efficient. Yeah. So um, one thing you mentioned as far as just the this, this social component of meetings, and this is very common, especially in a, a church group that's meeting, you know, we're neighbors, we go to church together, sure. we, we, you know, we like each other. And so it's easy to sort of uh, take a tangent and someone may say, oh, I got to tell you this hilarious story that happened last week in church. And then, and it is funny, right? And it's like, oh, we all laugh and then like think, okay, you know, where were we? Um, you know, and, and so those things are sort of tough to remove from the meeting because it feels like, oh, we're we're bonding here. You know, there's this, this team sure. effort and we like each other. Right. So as far as you talk about the, the use of the word minutia in your, in your book, uh, and I would classify this as sort of minutia, right? Is there, are there any, any other forms of minutia or, or how do we combat the minutia in meetings? Sure. Well, I think the best um, way of doing it is make meeting time incredibly purposeful. Uh, so if people have gathered together to answer three important questions and they only have 42 minutes to answer them, then they will stay focused mm. and present to answer them. So what I want to do is push out minutia 
by creating more urgency around the pressing matters. Um, but I also, you know, want to stress the fact that, you know, I want that um, wonderful interpersonal, um, you know, dynamic to emerge. But I just think it can happen before and after the meeting very readily. Um, and I think we just forget that by having a really good meeting, that's fun in and of itself. Yeah. Right. When people are all participating and engaging around an important topic, that's fun. That's fun. That yeah. is just as good as a good story. Yeah. Because I think naturally people love social environments, but I think also people love purpose and being That's right. feeling like they're part of something purposeful. So if you give them a, a meeting full of purpose, they're going to enjoy that. And then it's short and then they can move on and, and socialize right. after. Right. I mean, it's like, you know, we can all think about this in sports. Um, you know, we play basketball or whatever, volleyball. You know, if that team is in sync and people are working together and you're winning, and by in this case, winning just means by having engagement and coming up with good decisions. Like you finish the game and you're feeling energized, right? No one in the middle of the basketball game is telling a story about the grandmother, <laughs> yeah. right? They're they're present on being a team, and that is really just such a positive feeling that sustains you for a while. Yeah, and I remember uh, one group I was part of a stake presidency, I was part of, there were four or five of us in that meeting every week. And, you know, we'd get in, we'd get the work done. And then a lot of time there's a great gelato place down the street and we'd go and once the meeting was done, we'd go to the gelato place and just sort of shoot the breeze, right? And, sure. and have that social aspect. And so just maybe do it directly out of the meet after the meeting and everybody gets that social feel. I love it. Yeah. All right. So uh, I have a variety of, of things as we as we wrap up here, just some, um, and again, the, the book goes into depth with these, which I would recommend, but um, let's see what we haven't covered here. We talked about start, starting the meetings. Um, how about as far as like meeting updates and reports? Because oftentimes I see in our tradition is we have what's called a ward council and and there's about 10, 12 people in there. And it's easy to sort of come in and, and, and do the round robin, right? Like, all right, we'll start with you. We'll go around the circle and everybody give their, give your report of what's happening in your organization, right? Yes. What, what do we need to understand as far as giving reports? Because sometimes it's necessary to it answering the questions of the meeting. Yeah. So um, update meetings can be very, very frustrating for people, um, but we can make them better. And I will share. Um, two ways to do it. Uh, so first, um, we want to make sure that we communicate to people what a good update looks like. It's almost like we never had that conversation, right? What <laughs> is a good update? And then once we kind of decide what a good update is, we put people on the clock. <laughs> and it's pretty funny. You know, you say, okay, everyone has uh, 60 seconds to do an update. And it's jovial, it's funny, it's fun, but people stay focused. And so it makes the update part go quickly and purposefully. So that's kind of a fun technique to try. Um, number two, um, I'm really keen on silent updates. Mm. This is actually something that's very common at Twitter. Um, basically what happens, is people can do this on their laptops, maybe their phones, but not I not as easily on the phones. Um, basically, you everyone opens up a Google Doc um, or a Dropbox file, whatever shared document you want to mm -hmm. use, um, and you tell people, "I want everyone to take the next two minutes and type in their update." Mm -hmm. So everyone is now doing it simultaneously, and then after you type in your update, I want you to start reading everyone else's updates. You can add comments using, right, track changes, simple, easy. And what happens is you have this writing period and then you have this commenting period. And basically update meetings start to become incredibly dynamic and engaging, but there's no talking. Mm. And people love it. They absolutely love it. Because um, they're, they're able, like, is it, what's inevitable with update meetings is, there are certain people's updates that are completely irrelevant to you. 
So when you're doing this all in silence in a document, you can start focusing on other people's updates that really are relevant, right? And you're saying, hey, my committee is actually working on something similar. Let me tell you about this, right? So you're having this really meaningful discourse, um, but you're doing it on your terms and you're doing it while lots of people are talking. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And because one one of my biggest pet peeves is sitting in, in some of these meetings is when when that one individual raises his hand and has a comment or wants to bring up a subject and it's so specific to their organization or, or the right. problems that they're the projects they're working on. And I think, man, why don't you save that to when you meet with the 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 boss one to one, right? Like yep. why are you taking the time of this meeting to do it? So this allows them to put it there, which it alerts yep. the the bishop or stake president or whomever who can maybe handle it later. But it gives that person the feeling like, okay, that I wanted to bring this up and now I, I had a chance to. But then the facilitator doesn't necessarily have to go there at all. Really. Exactly. Good. I love that. I love that. And, and that leads into another question I have as far as uh, I, I love the research and um, how you articulate the how um, silence can be used in a meeting. Because we sometimes feel like, hey, if we're getting together, let's talk, let's we can be silent on our, on our own time, but silence can be a pretty important part in a meeting. Any, any thoughts to that? Yeah. I mean, silence is actually, it's a way of engaging people. Um, you know, if I, uh, um, I'll, I'll use an example of a very common task, um, which is um, brainstorming, hmm. right? And we know from the research that groups that brainstorm in silence writing their ideas or typing them into a Google Doc or writing on index cards, um, groups brainstorming in silence generate nearly twice as many ideas, and those ideas tend to be more creative. Hmm. And the reason being is that um, you're not filtering, right? Everyone's talking at once, but you're not interrupting anyone. Um, you're not filtering your ideas based on what someone else is saying, right? You are able to be your genuine self, bringing up whatever ideas come to mind. Um, so silence unlocks that potential. And so if, if I have 10 people in, in a meeting, I mean, silent brainstorming is like just the perfect tool to use, right? If I say, okay, we're now gonna brainstorm, everyone open up their computers or there's free apps you know, where people yeah. can just click on a link and start typing on their phones and all that information is recorded, right? And then you have that brainstorming and then there's apps that even allow you to start commenting on others' ideas. Then you could even vote on people's ideas. So as a way of I narrowing down a list to the five best, right? There's so much that's unlocked with silence. Yeah, and I love that. Especially, you know, I've, we've done a few episodes and uh, articles about uh, introverts, especially in the religious context, and talk about, you know, sometimes it's hard to draw those introverts into the meeting when there's so many aggressive voices in the room, sure. um, and this allows them to to contribute in a way that's very safe because uh, they're just typing, and then yep. you know maybe they get called upon and they don't mind speaking, but sometimes they they just don't want to step on others or, or speak over people trying to get a, a word in, and this yep. allows that to be facilitated. Right. Absolutely correct. Um, you know, again, what I talk about in the book is uh, I never speak in about in absolutes. So I'm not advocating that every meeting should have silence and yeah. silent brainstorming. But there are times where that approach could be fantastic. So an intentional meeting leader thinks about the meeting and says, you know what, maybe silent brainstorming actually could work really well. And then they give it a go. Yeah, they give it a go, and you know, then they reflect um, on how it went, and then that way they know for the next time, um, you know, whether it's the right tool or not the right tool. But we have lots of these, lots of opportunities to make good choices. Yeah, love that. Anything else as far as silence goes that uh, we no, worth mentioning? They can they can read the book, right? That's right. Yes. <laughs> um, how about technology in meetings? Uh, I mean, especially these days, it can be so distracting. One notification can completely pull somebody out of their, that focus sure. and that uh, discussion. Yeah. Um, so I often think about multitasking in meetings as being a symptom of a bad meeting, right? Mm -hmm. It's a way of an individual of reclaiming control 
over their time. Um, so that's kind of how I look at multitasking. Um, but technology certainly can be leveraged effectively in meetings to add to meetings. So for example, the things that we talked about with silence, um, technology can facilitate those. Um, when we have remote meetings, um, you know, using video is a really great way of kind of building more engagement um, with attendees, similar to you know what you chose to do here. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I definitely think that technology and meetings can be a wonderful thing. Uh, here's another uh, example. Uh, you know, we when we think about a meeting and we think about a screen as being where we put our PowerPoint slides. Well, there's an alternative use for that. Uh, it can become the place where we are actually, we have a Google Doc open and we're keeping meeting minutes. Hmm. So meeting minutes are being kept in real time for all to see. So they're seeing this recording of what happened. They're seeing their name populated next to the thing that they agreed to do. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's lots of neat applications um, you know, for technology and meetings, but certainly if people are all there multitasking, that's an indication that you probably are not leading an engaging meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that approach. Not, I mean, because it's easy to say, okay, everybody, here's a basket. Everybody put your phone in a basket or something. But to really look at it, no, they're giving you feedback of this meeting. And so it can be sort of a, a feedback indicator, right? Yeah. Like, oh, look, I, this must not be a great meeting. There, there's a lot right. of technology use. What could we change about right. the meeting to make it more engaging, right? That's right. That's right. I love it. Awesome. Um, and then also, you know, I think I mentioned it earlier, just this, uh, or you did, as far as sometimes you just sit in meetings and you think, why didn't they just send me an email? Like there, there's this feeling like leaders need to make sure that everybody hears this or they need to download information. And so we spend an hour just hearing stuff they could have typed into an email for us to read on our, on our right. own time. And then I also like this, this uh, something I never thought of it. Sometimes in a meeting you have a presenter come in uh, for one reason or another and present, and that can take up a lot of time, but you talk about maybe having, them read that presentation. So it's, I guess I'm asking you too many questions in, in one, but um, it's just this concept of, of downloading information. How do we avoid sure. the meeting that should have been an email? Yeah. Um, so I think, um, you know, one of the things that we hit upon is thinking about designing a meeting as a set of questions. Um, I think that's a, a, a tool for doing that. Um, right, because if you can't think of any questions, that means it's most likely informational and that you could use an email. Um, but there's there's other tools that leaders can do too. I'm like, I'm a big fan of a leader actually recording their voice. Uh, so hmm. you can do a quick um, audio recording or video recording. There's, um, if a leader thinks that they have a lot of informational content, but they don't like to type, um, which is perfectly reasonable, yeah. Well, pick up your phone and record your voice. Give your messages. What are the key things that you wanted everyone to know? And record yourself and then send people out the link. Um, this is actually pretty wonderful. Um, people, the podcast culture, well, you know this better than everyone. <laughs> right? Podcast culture is wonderful. People love podcasts. And one of the things that they love about podcasts is that they can listen to it at their own time. Yeah. And right, when it makes sense speed, for them, right? <laughs> at double, at, at one and a half speed. Yeah. Um, and so, as a result, a leader who just records themselves sends a link to people. You know, that becomes like not disruptive to individuals. It's incredibly informational, and then that leader can just say, "If you have any questions about any of this content, just email me or pick up a phone." Yeah. And you know, you're you're basically just getting the information out in a different way while still honoring people's time. Um, so every meeting can have an informational component, but it should be a small percentage. It should really be no more than five, 10 minutes at the most. Once that starts to get larger, then I encourage the meeting leader to think about these alternative ways of getting out the information, recording themselves, sending an email, um, give it a go. The other way, um, and I know we're running low on time, is you record yourself with the information um, you send it out to people and then you kind of start the meeting saying, hey, were there any questions about anything I sent out? Mm -hmm. Most likely people won't have any. And you say, great, let's move. Yeah. 
Yeah, perfect. And there's so many apps out there that I'm just thinking one that my extended family uses Marco Polo, where you make a quick video message and sends it to the whole group, like getting a simple Marco Polo group together could facilitate yeah. that easily or, or simple email. Right. So love it. Love it. Um, Perfect. Uh, and then as far as like having a presenter in the meeting or having someone present, you, you say maybe even have them write down the information so that because people can read faster than. Right. Just, you know, right. Listen. So this is a technique that's used at Amazon. Uh, so Amazon basically doesn't um, let people do PowerPoint presentations. Instead, people have to write basically a memo um, of their idea. Uh, their presentation gets recorded into a written document. Then people arrive at the meeting and just all read the written document. And then there's a conversation about it. Um, and you're absolutely correct. People read at um, faster than they listen. Uh, they have more control over the pacing, which people seem to like. But Amazon had a more strategic purpose around it besides giving people more time. Uh, basically, their thinking was that they wanted ideas to be um, evaluated more on the merits of their um, ideas, the kind of the merits of the concepts. So, you know, when things are presented, then often the charisma of the presenter starts to become relevant, right? But if you read something and evaluate it based on the written word, then A, the person writing it has to be much more kind of aware of the arguments, right? And then the discussion tends to be more about the arguments um, being presented um, in the document. So what Amazon feels is that it gets a much richer, deeper, substantive, thoughtful discussion when you remove presentations um, from, the, from a meeting. Hmm. Love that. Love that. Because we can get so bogged down and, and time filled up so much when, all right, you know, so-and-so is going to present on this thing and we all sit and listen and it, and it kind of pulls us out of the, the energy right. of the meeting for sure. Well, awesome, Stephen, this has been so good. And uh, before I ask you, as far as people want to reach out to you or follow you, is, is there anything else we haven't covered that maybe you want to uh, mention before we, we wrap up? Um. Well, I mean, you know, your interview was extremely thorough and okay. um, I really appreciate it. And yeah. no, I, I just hope people um, check out the book. It's yeah. it Tell really us where, where we can get it or where we can learn sure. more about your research. Well, I mean, I definitely come to my website. Um, so the, my website is just my name. So it's stevenrogelberg.com. Okay. So okay. stevenrogelberg.com. Uh, or you can go to the surprising science dot com awesome. uh, the surprising science dot com and and go there and I have additional resources um, I have links to the book um, you know different media things as well but I just encourage people to you know give the book a shot I mean one of the things that's been so exciting has been people's reactions to this book right because no one wants to I mean your your initial reaction is a, a book about meetings is going to be just as more boring as a going to a meeting. <laughs> But this book is different. I mean, the science yeah. of meetings is really energizing and exciting. And I've been blown away that, you know, Washington Post named it the number one book, um, you know, for leaders and Business Insider top 14. And, and it just speaks to the fact that people want to make their meetings better, but they wanted the message to be something a little different than I think what's been currently out there. So I encourage people to give it a go. And I really appreciate our conversation as a way of kind of bringing the science forward. And I do think it has just such wonderful applications, both for, you know, organizations where people are, you know, paid. Um, but I love the idea of honoring volunteers time the best that we can. Mm -hmm.